Good morning, one more time. Good morning, good morning. My name is Stephanie. I'm the lead pastor here. I see a couple people that I haven't met yet. If it's one of your first few times here, thank you for having the courage to come and to join us. We just really appreciate it. We love getting more people connected to our mission here at Mel City. Um, this question, I have a really easy answer to this question. I am looking forward to the futuristic technology of a printer that works. One that does not chew up papers or drool out ink. That's my futuristic. The future is bright. I can't wait. I can't wait until that technology exists. So some of you in this room could help us with that, make it happen. All right. Uh, today, before I have one more announcement that I, I, I convinced Pastor Adobe to let me give, and that is today we're having a bonus baptism. Yes. Some people, some people were like, I, I still want to get baptized. I was out of town. And so we're going to go right after the service, straight down. We're not going to have lunch because I, I think somebody has football to watch or something. But we're going to go right down to the river and we're going to, we're going to baptize those people. And there's, there's an opportunity for others to join in. If you're a follower of Jesus and you have not yet been baptized, there's no reason to wait. It's not about achieving spiritual maturity in some form. It's actually the opposite. It's about saying Jesus is going to have to be enough for who I am, and when we think about wa the water, you're going down into the water, coming back out. Jesus' death and his resurrection so that we could live forever with him. And he's enough. His death is enough. His resurrection is enough. And so if you're interested, would you just if you take courage and come talk with me? I've got these towels here. In August, I got six towels to say, hey, if anyone has not signed up, you could get baptized. How many people did we end up adding? Six. So I got 12. <laughs> right? I mean, I got to... Shoot my shot. I got to go for it. I'm going for it. So, no, in all seriousness, just, just come chat with me about it. And maybe today's not the day, but I'd love to talk with you about it. So join me if you can. Um, if you know me, you know that I often like to start out with a question. So today I have a question to begin. And the question is, what is your vision of the good life? When you think about what makes life good, what is it? When you, if someone said, can you define the good life, what would you say? When you have a picture in your mind. I, I can think of my gut reaction, like a good night's sleep. I, I love getting a good night's sleep, uh, a tasty meal, right? Uh, deeper things than that. When you have meaningful work, life is good when you have meaningful work, right? Or life is good when you have close, deep relationships or when everybody in your family is healthy. I bet all of you could write down right now the things that makes life good in your mind. But the reality is, is that we probably have different answers, all of us would have different answers, partly because we have different influences in our life that have told us what the good life is supposed to be. And we all can think of those things in our life that encourage us to think what makes life good. And I was thinking about this personally, and I feel like some of this messaging in my life started when I was really young. And I go back to like middle school and high school. When I was in middle school and high school, there was a very popular craft, okay? And it was to take magazines and cut them up and make a collage, Anybody else do this? This is very, very fun. And, and I would make collages of like what I thought the good life was, like my vision for my life, like the dream board kind of thing. I know others of you did this. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. So I went and I looked to see if I could find, and I couldn't find my collages of my middle school and high school years. So I recreated one for you. All right, so check this out. This is what, this is what one of my collages would have looked like. All right. I... And I'm not being hyperbolic. Really, I really thought I had a ch chance with teen star Jonathan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> like, I wrote letters that was like, if we could just be in the same spot at the same time. And I was serious. Uh, my, my soccer team winning, my hockey team winning, whatever version of the game of life my family played at that time in the 90s. Uh, you know, the newest technology, like the Discman, was real big. So, I mean, like, the good life. And I had a wonderful family, I still do. I had a really meaningful church home that really helped me think about what life was all about. However, Seventeen Magazine and like TV shows influenced my understanding of the good life a lot more than I wish it had. And I also wish I would have grown out of that completely. But the thing is, is that there's still things that are telling me all the time, messages telling me all the time what is supposed to make life good or what's supposed to make it better. And people make a lot of money if they can convince me what would make life better, can't they? Like there's going to be like um, some commercials you're going to watch later today that might have some football in, the, in between them. <laughs> like, yikes, right? That's our life. And so we realize that as adults, we still feel this pull of the things trying to tell us what would make life good. There's so many messages. 
But this is a tale as old as time. People forever have been getting influenced messages about what makes life good, what's going to make life better. And so when we think about that, when you think about that in your life, you might think, what is it that's influencing you now? And if we go back to the time when uh, we see the people were first hearing the words of Scripture, when people were walking with Jesus, they too struggled with so many messages telling them what was supposed to make their life good. In fact, when we think about right now, we're looking in the Sermon on the Mount, an in-depth look at that Sermon on the Mount right now. It's in Matthew 5 through 7, just three chapters. So if you have a Bible, Matthew 5 is where we're going to be today uh, at the beginning there. If you want to pull up an app or we'll have it on the screen. But in, in this time, in the first century, when the Sermon on the Mount was first being spoken by Jesus, there were so many influences the Jewish community had about what made life good. In fact, even though they didn't have cable news or Instagram, there were culturally traditions. It was a tradition to declare your vision for what made life good. And people would choose to follow different teachers who had their vision for the good life. In fact, a rabbi or a teacher would have their good life statements that you could either ascribe to or not. And so people would come around these people and say, oh, I, I think the good life is the t- this teacher or that teacher. And they would be saying this Hebrew word, ashrei, which means good or fortunate, and they would have these good life statements. I read a couple of them last week. I'll, I'll tell you some more where that came from. They, these teachers would say things like, ashrei, or the good life, belongs to those who finds a friend. The good life belongs to those who do not sin with their tongue. And then some of them were a little weirder, like, the good life belongs to those who don't have to serve their inferior. There was lots of different opinions about what made the life, like, the good life. And and people would ascribe to these different things. There's also beautiful places, like in Psalm 84, where we see these good life statements in in the wisdom literature. So, for example, Psalm 84 says, Ashrei, or the good life, it is for those who dwell in God's house who are ever praising God. Ashrei are those whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage, on moving towards God. So when Jesus begins his most famous sermon with a well-known pattern of speech like this, everyone listening would have known right away what he's doing. Ashrei, the good life, is for those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is this rabbi, Jesus, doing to open up his most famous sermon. The good life belongs to those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He's giving his vision for the good life. The good life belongs to the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And then Jesus continues through these nine statements to summarize his vision for the good life. Some have come to know these as the Beatitudes, which means blessings in Latin. However, in the Greek and the Hebrew, it's best to think of it as fortunate or good, how good or how fortunate. There's one thing that's very noticeable, I think, to any of us about Jesus' vision for the good life. Most of them do not sound very good. Yeah? Poor in spirit, mourning, grief, meek, persecuted. So while Jesus is bringing up a very common phrase that people would have been used to hearing in their context, it is immediately evident that Jesus' vision of the good life is like nothing that they've ever heard before. It's totally different. Theologian Scott McKnight, in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, which is an awesome one, I recommend it, he talks about how the the group of people sitting on the side of the mountain listening to Jesus would have been considered what was referred to as the anawim, The Anawim historians describe as a group of people in the Jewish community who were economically disadvantaged, yet they were known for trusting God and longing for the Messiah to come. This would have been a group of people that people would refer to, the Anawim. Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus, are considered part of the Anawim. The word in Hebrew, Anawim, means those who are bowed down, sometimes translated as humble. The Anawim were known as those who even in times of suffering remained in their loyal devotion and surrender to God. Because they saw that God was the one who was going to bring them the goodness that was going to fill the voids that they had in their life due to their poverty and due to their persecution. This is the, the reputation of this group of people that we know is the primary audience of the Sermon on the Mount. So what is Jesus doing by starting out his sermon naming the poor in spirit and the meek and the downcast? Why is he saying that their life is the good life? What is he doing? He is telling his audience that he sees them. 
He sees them. He knows them. He sees the situation that they're in. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount now, we look back and we think, this is this incredible collection of Jesus' teachings. It gives us this invitation to align with the heart of Jesus and to be activated and to join in what Jesus is doing in the world. So the Beatitudes, starting with this rather strange collection of good life statements, can seem kind of a strange way to start such a profound collection of teachings. But when we know Jesus' original audience, it's actually a pretty smart communication technique. To say right off the bat to your audience, I see you in your pain and in your struggle. I see those, I see what you're experiencing. And he says, God has drawn close to you. Powerful way for him to start out this whole collection of teachings. Jesus chose to come to this group of people first to announce his kingdom. The Anawim, the poor, impoverished, sick, powerless group of people... Jesus says the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, these are kind of synonyms, meaning the reign of God, the full presence of God, the reign of King Jesus. When Jesus is king, what is the experience that we have? Jesus says this kingdom is coming in their midst, in the midst of their poverty, in the midst of their powerlessness. Why are these people the first people in line to get to hear about the coming kingdom in their midst? Because they are most ready to receive it. Why? Because they have so little already. Their hands are empty. They're ready to receive what God has for them. In fact, their only hope in their life, they're known for having their only hope being in God. The good life belongs to those who know that they need Jesus. Because they are the people who are most likely not to miss what Jesus is doing in their midst. And this was a group of people who knew they needed God. And they were ready to see what God was doing. Jesus is turning on its head who society might see as the fortunate ones. This audience, they are the fortunate ones. But nobody would have thought that. But this is what Jesus says. And when King Jesus reigns, this is a new kind of king of a new kind of kingdom. And sometimes it seems kind of upside down or backwards almost. These good life statements, many times theologians call it the announcement of the great reversal that accompanies the kingdom of God. The great reversal that accompanies the kingdom of God. So today we're going to look at the second statement. Last week we looked at the first. Matthew 5, 4, uh, in the NIV, this is what it says. Uh, Jesus has said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's use the paraphrase statement so we can see it's actually the second part that's the blessing, not the first. How good is life for those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The blessing is that they will be comforted. The Anawim, these humble people, they had so much to mourn in life. They had so much to mourn when it came to the lack of agency they had in the world. They were amongst the, the Jewish community was one of the groups of people within the Roman Empire that was oppressed. And these were the people amongst that group of people who had the least control about the situation. And because of their poverty and because of the conditions that they've been in, most of them, either they or someone they know, has experienced a loss, an acute loss of somebody because poverty leads to premature death. They are people who are mourning in so many ways. Uh, look at this description of what that word mourning would have meant to them in their context. They would have heard this both grieving experiences and tragedy and injustice and death personally, but also mourning is those who reach out to others in grief and compassion when they experience tragedy and injustice and death. So maybe when you hear the word mourning, you think about something that's happening for you or as individuals. But in that context, it meant both, both personally and corporately. People are coming alongside each other and in that grief together. Now, what's interesting is Jesus throughout the Sermon on the Mount never declares that he's the Messiah. But there are hints along the way. And these first two uh, Beatitudes are hints that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that these Anawim had been waiting for. Uh, hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth, the prophet Isaiah was declaring who this Messiah was going to be in Isaiah 61. Look at how this is described in Isaiah 61 as, as a, I would say, Jesus just echoing this reality in those first two Beatitudes. Isaiah 61, verse 1, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. 
Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. And provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry, reads that scroll of Isaiah in a group of, of Jewish believer, people who are believers in Yahweh together, and he says to them, I am the fulfillment of what I just read. Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy. How good is life for those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This one is a tough one for us, isn't it? Nobody is like, I'm going to sign up for grief. Nobody's getting excited about mourning, yet we all experience it, don't we? All of us. Today here on stage, we have this bouquet of these 14 roses, and they represent the people who have died, who were a part of our community. Um, since in January of 2023, our community came together and adopted Elam Church, and since then, 13 people have died, or we have celebrated funerals for, for those family members as a part of our community in less than two years. And the 14th rose represents all the other people that you have lost that have, are close to you that we didn't necessarily have a celebration of life for them here. But you have experienced the acute experience of losing somebody close in your life. These flowers are in honor of these people. Grief is so heavy. Mourning is so challenging. How can Jesus say that it's good? The brokenness of the world that we live in means that when it comes to grief and loss, it's not just losing people to death, right? There's all these other losses we experience from the brokenness in the world, from the way that evil works in the world. I think about just this week for me. I heard stories of grief, yes, from those who have experienced the death of someone that they love. I heard stories of grief from those who are battling illness and all the loss that comes with their physical health decline. I heard stories of people talking about the grief and the loss that they're having because their adult children are far from God and they ache. I had multiple conversations with different groups of people about the grief that they have from churches that they experienced abusive behavior to people who God loves. Multiple experiences of people who are mourning the fact that hundreds, sometimes thousands of people are in pain because of power plays in God's community. I have sat with people and saw the grief on their face because they're struggling to make ends meet. Or sit with people who have lo the loss of a relationship that didn't work out. And that all the other collection of the losses that psychologists have started to call ambiguous grief. That we're all carrying sometimes. And so today, even though this is challenging, I want to invite you to intentionally think about grief. Just for this time to think about three spaces of grief, okay? Just to kind of help us get our minds around it. Just like we saw that definition of mourning, there's grief from personal losses. There's grief from those who are close to in our life. We all have somebody we're close to, don't we, who've lost something significant. And then finally, the grief we see from the brokenness in the world around us. Jesus says, how good is life for those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What are we supposed to make of Jesus saying that grief is good? Uh, honestly, it reminds me of Charlie Brown. Does anybody else have, like, good grief in their mind? Like, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, like, grief is good. He's saying, like, good grief, right? But grief is good. Jesus says that. What does this mean? Grief is good because then we will receive the blessing of being comforted by God and by others. What comfort do we have when it comes to grief and to mourning in our life? Well, the most profound thing about Jesus saying, blessed are those and uh, the good life belongs to those who grieve, is the fact that he knows exactly what that's like. Because Jesus mourned and Jesus grieved we are comforted by knowing that Jesus mourned. When his friend Lazarus died, he wept. Yes, he performed a miracle and Lazarus came back to life. But even knowing that he was about to do this, Jesus cried along with those who were mourning. 
Jesus comes to the, the town where these people are gathering, and the, he comes on day four of seven of the morning ritual considered and named sitting Shiva, where the Jewish community still many today still practice this ritual of for seven days, if your first degree relative dies, then you take a break from all your routines and you do that in order to focus on your loss. And they sit together, either on the floor or on really low benches, without their shoes on, choosing to avoid many physical comforts. Because rather, they receive the comfort of friends who will consistently come and visit them. For seven days, there's an open house in their house as they sit near the floor for their friends and their family and their neighbors to come and offer comfort. And so Jesus approaches on day four of seven. And as soon as Jesus, it says in the scripture, sees his friends weeping and mourning, it says that he is deeply moved in his spirit and he is troubled and he joins in their tears. Yes, he brought Lazarus back to life, but we know like Lazarus did eventually die again later. Why did Jesus do this? It wasn't about Lazarus because in that moment it was Jesus' opportunity to say something that we know is true. He says at that moment when Lazarus comes back to life, I am the resurrection and the life. That's what that whole Lazarus miracle was about. Not about that Lazarus guy having, you know, immortality on earth. Jesus is mourning in this moment the pain and the grief of his friends. And we know that Jesus must have engaged in the practice of sitting Shiva in his life because we don't know the circumstances, but we know that as a man who's now in his early 30s, his dad has passed away. We find out later that Mary is a widow. And so Jesus must have practiced this. Jesus mourned as he looked over the city of Jerusalem knowing because he was God that there was so much earthly destruction and pain that was going to happen. And he mourned over the city and as Jesus prayed the night before he died, he was grieved by the brokenness of the world that he was going to take upon himself the next day. I, I think of the quote that Queen Elizabeth was famous for saying, grief is the price we pay for love. Grief is the price we pay for love. Nobody knew that more than Jesus. The price that you pay for love. And I think that Jesus intimately knew this. But then there's a second way that we are, more, are, are comforted when we mourn, and that is, spoiler alert, death is not the end of the story. Death is not the end of the story. Restoration gets the final word. This is the, what we get to see, that Jesus, God in the flesh, knew that death was not the original design, was it? It's the brokenness entering the world that means that death enters the story. But the end of death is the end of story. I mean, in a way, death on planet Earth was grace to humanity because living in endless perpetual brokenness is too much to bear. But our souls were made to live forever. And Jesus makes this possible because of his death and resurrection. When we mourn and grieve, it is so hard. It is so challenging. But it is also good because it reminds us that death on Earth is not the end. The suffering that we feel when we grieve, it's a longing, isn't it? It's an ache, a longing at the core of who we are, thinking there's got to be something more than this pain. And there is something more. That's what that longing is all about. I often say, longing is what hope looks like on a hard day. I wish that wasn't true, but hope and longing, they go hand in hand. You can't separate them. Loss brings, to us, brings us to the end of ourselves, doesn't it? Loss brings us to the end of our rope, but the end of ourselves is the beginning of Jesus. And so when grief or mourning brings us to the end of ourselves, which I know for many of you that has where, is where you have been even this year, it's the beginning of Jesus' comfort for our very souls. How good is life for those who mourn because they will be comforted? Third, when we mourn, we are comforted by the Holy Spirit's presence in our suffering. And the presence of others who are able to come alongside us in our grief. The Anawim, this, this poor, impoverished, sick, powerless group of people, had very little ability to avoid their grief and suffering, didn't they? 
They, they didn't have the kind of opportunities we had. We seem to have every opportunity to avoid hard feelings, don't we? I'll just speak for myself, okay? I'll leave you guys out of it. When I think about myself, I think about how much easier it is for me to choose some form of cheap self-comfort instead of turning to Jesus with my losses. I think about how easy it is for me to just choose distractions and to like jump into like, like treat yourself culture and just be like avoid it. Instead of coming to the people in my life who I know are mature enough to sit with me in my grief. It's so much easier to get distracted. And I think about, you know, what Jesus experienced. Just Let's just have a real talk moment for those of us Minnesotans here. Can you kind of imagine an average Minnesotan, particularly those from European descent, having a memorial service and then going back to their house, okay, opening the doors to everybody for seven days? Right? And then uh, you can't serve those people. You can't give them a hot dish or pop or coffee. Like, they're supposed to serve you. We wouldn't be able to do it, right? So many of us wouldn't be able to do it. And I am not advocating that we adopt the Jewish practice of sitting Shiva or any other practice from another culture that's not our own. I'm just wanting to point out that there's reasons that Christians in many cultures around the world have practices of grief and mourning that last longer than one afternoon. They last days, sometimes weeks, because then there's an opportunity together to be able to grieve and mourn because it's good. It's in the willingness not to run from grief that we can see its goodness in our lives. It's in the willingness not to run from it, not to get distracted, not to choose these things. The people in this story, they didn't have enough in their own disposal to distract themselves as easily. What we can see that the comfort that we experience from God, the longing that we have for God's kingdom to come now and in the future, this is good. And most of us, if we're honest, we have like a total aversion, like we're totally have an aversion towards the idea of choosing mourn, mourning and grieving, Right? Some of you are like, I literally want to get out of this room right now, but please just hang in there a little bit. God says through what Jesus is saying that God's going to bless us with comfort. And it's not like a cozy, carefree comfort. It's the deep abiding love and experience of the truth that you are never alone. That God is with us. Look at this definition of mourning based on Jesus uh, in what we know is what it meant there in Matthew. If this is true, if this is how they would have heard it, it's not personal only, but also corporate, then if you're not in a place where you are experiencing grief or loss in an acute way, then I think the invitation is to choose to enter into it with other people. We don't want to do that sometimes, but that doesn't mean it's not good. And if you are experiencing grief and loss in your life right now, Jesus invites you to let your heart grieve so that you can be comforted by God. And by other people. But the thing is, is that I feel like we are in this, this culture that's like a, it's not okay to be not okay. But Jesus is like saying the opposite. If grief is the price that you pay for love, then it was good that you had that love. And it's good then that there's grief, even though it's hard. Jesus is the opposite of the, it's not okay to not be okay. Jesus is saying, it is good to be okay with those feelings that are not okay. And I just think about this, for the record, psychology also agrees with that. <laughs> just so we know, if you don't process through your grief, it often comes out in secondary emotions like fear and anger. People are like popping off at folks like yelling, but they're actually just really sad. We know even, this, we're not even going to get into the medical reasons for processing grief because it also physically shows that people have physical illness that comes from not processing grief. Jesus didn't say the good life belongs to those who put on a happy face so that no one will know that they're not okay. Jesus did not say the good life belongs to those who choose self-comfort because then they will be distracted from the pain and the suffering in their life and the world around them. He knew that wasn't good for us. He gave an invitation through what he said. The good life belongs to those who are grieving because then they will be comforted. So what if you chose to enter into that? Every person here just like, what's one step? What's one step for you? A next step. Maybe for you it's acknowledging that there's been some grief you've been trying to ignore. 
Maybe for others you're like, look, I actually, I've been carrying a lot of grief. I need to enter into a process to move through that intentionally. And maybe for others it's just this realization that even though things might be feeling pretty good in our own life, we can choose to enter in to the grief in the mourning of others and in the brokenness in the world. That when we see that in the world, it's not just, oh, this is too hard. It's I bring this to Jesus. This is the invitation that we have. What might it look for you to carry grief with you intentionally to pursue time and space to be comforted by Jesus who is intimately acquainted with grief and suffering? So think about these three areas I mentioned earlier. When you think about grief from personal losses, grief carried by those close to you, and grief that we see in the world around us, and I've got two invitations for you. The first one is this. If you're someone who has been carrying some grief in your life and you haven't let other people into that process with you, can I ask you to consider reaching out to somebody? A friend, we've got a care team of people who would love to do that. The first time that I met with a Christian therapist was right after my dad passed away when I was 17 years old. It changed my life. We've got a whole list of people that you can consider if you're feeling like stuck in that grief and, and not able to get through it. Or you feel like you can't touch it, I need some support. Then, then that might be that for you. But can you please talk to somebody about it? Because your health holistically depends on it. And then my second invitation is for all of us here today. Uh, Ashish is just going to sing this song of reflection. And I'm going to invite you just in the next step for you to open up your heart in a spirit of prayer in these three areas. What is it the spirit might say to you that is grief that you can carry intentionally because grief is good? Some of you are thinking, I hope this is a short song so I can get out of the grief room. But I actually, I'm actually going to invite you to consider taking it with you intentionally. In fact, uh, some of you can see these little um, ribbons that are pass, start passing them back in the rows. Um, you could put it on your wrist. You could put it on a bag or some keys. Um, but what if we were to say, I'm going to take this with me and open up space even in small moments for Jesus to comfort me. And you'll see that you'll actually have to use scissors to cut it off. And that would be just a moment of releasing that grief to Jesus after you've processed it. Might be a couple days, might be a week. If it's still on for a month, that's when we get the therapist list, right? Okay, do you see what I'm saying? We have an opportunity, if grief is good, to enter into that because then we get the blessing of being comforted by God. And so I just invite you to think about whatever that next step would be as you listen to Ashish sing this song. Just open up your mind and heart to whatever that might be and, and reflect on that. Maybe jot some things down if you need to as we think about these three areas of grief in our lives.
know that death is not the end of the story of God. We know that those cries, they don't last forever. They turn into worship because Jesus restores all things and it says there'll be no more crying and no more death and no more tears for all the former things will have been passed away because Jesus is making all things new. That's the future of the story. And God's love remains now as we cry out and will remain all the way through to the endless experience we have of living in the full love of God in our lives. That's the invitation to us. So as Pastor Donna comes to lead us in communion, would you let us pray for you? Would you allow us to come alongside you as you think about what it looks like to enter into the goodness that can come from grief in our lives?